welcome to the Future Society and start of second semester lectures. Thanks very much for turning up. Um, as you can see, we have a fun and action-packed semester ahead of us. We have Grant Gray coming up tonight, which uh, is on Tuesday the 20th. And next week we have uh, even famous or indeed famous Professor Michael Bentley of Great Spain Historiography. Uh, after that, we hopefully will have the president of the IFF, our sponsor, in some time in the next month or two. And then the big, big date of the year is going to be Sir Crispin Tickell, I think it's pronounced. And he's coming on May, and uh, hopefully we're going to take out anyone in the student union for that. It should hopefully have at least 100 people at it, which would be a slight improvement of what we have here. If you don't know who he is, you may remember if you've read uh, James Lovelock's latest book, which I think is called Revenge of Gaia, the guy who wrote the introduction to it was Sir Christian Tickell. And the reason why he's so famous is because he was the guy who originally popularized climate change. So, I mean, it was known about until the end of the 1970s. So Crispin wrote a very, very famous book on it, I think Climate Change and uh, yeah, Climate Change and World Affairs, I think it was, which uh, really popularized it among the Western governments. It even got into Thatcher's speeches for a bit, then it faded off at the end of sort of the 1980s, 19, early 1990s, and then effectively it's come back again in the sort of 2000s. Um, he's very famous, he's in being everything. Uh, he negotiated Britain's entry into the EU. Uh, he has also been the UN Ambassador for Britain. He's the chair, or sorry, the talk, by the way, will be chaired by our much beloved rector, Simon Pepper, who uh, also has an environmental background, and we're all very much looking forward to that. We hope you'll all come to it. I say this because people tend to watch the video rather than come to lectures sometimes. They're all far too busy. <laughs> anyway, um, that's all on our website, which you all probably know, and I will just kick in the, yeah, there we are, good thing. Right, so I think I'll tell it to go and do that. Anyway, Rob Gray is one of the world's most cited economists. I think he's the most cited author in accounting. He is one of the people who are the leading theoreticians within accounting, as far as I'm aware. Almost every paper you go and read to do with anything to do with accounting will tend to have either Rob Gray or one of the proteges of Rob Gray, from what I've noticed in the few years that I've been studying it. Sustainable development, one also, um, yeah, can sort of point the camera. <laughs> <laughs> is it pointing right? Is it? Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, in sustainable development, I believe you are the seventh most cited author uh, in 2000. I'm not sure. Might be, might not be. I don't know. I read that somewhere at some point. I don't actually know. But again, I do know from reading the, the papers which I've read that uh, Rob has turned up many times again as well. So now we're just very fortunate to have him here. And I think there's no doubt that um, Rob is a great asset to the university. We're very thankful that he's been coming up tonight. He follows on partially from last semester's lecture by Crawford Spence, where those of you who went to it remember, um, Crawford did a, a very um, deep analysis of corporate social responsibility. Uh, and certainly had a lot of very pithy comments to make and questions and answers afterwards. Uh, it would be certainly a lot of fun. Um, thank you very much for coming. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. After that, uh, obviously, uh, obviously entirely incorrect introduction. And of course, uh, most important thing, following on, I'm just keeping the seat warm until Sir Christmas to Kelly turns up. Ask questions to be girl, there's no way I can do this formally at all. So, um, this is a bunch of stuff I've been talking about for years, and uh, we'll see. And we get on. I wanted to talk about very quickly about five things. Um, just to touch it on. Some of you have seen before, some of you haven't. And uh, dig in as soon as you think there's anything to argue about. I wanted to make a uh, develop back to a point that I made 20 years ago, and nobody's disproved it, which I found quite interesting. And nobody's been attacked it, which is very unusual, uh, which is given the way we do accounting, environmental desecration is inevitable. Which makes which gets attention and it's quite entertaining. Um, briefly to talk about finance, a little bit about uh, language, more importantly about accountability, and then what we individually can do in terms of civil society. So, a brief whistle stop tour during the last 30 years of work in the area, and just dig in and argue and yell and do um, I still love this cartoon. 
the, the story behind it is halfway entertaining. My first trip to New Zealand was in the 80s. I was thinking about immigration. Um, I sat there on my own because my family had gone back home in a laundrette and picked up a Judge Dredd cartoon where the opening comment was, sorry I shot at you, I thought you were a countess. And this, of course, attracted my attention. And, and the story finishes with this question, and if we did this, this slide. Um, and of course, I, I think exactly what I mean, that uh, Candace is probably going to destroy the, at least the, uh, I'd like to at least show that. The way we're going to do it is just run through some rather clunky graphics, just to illustrate a, a rather basic point. Those of you who don't have your account, you'll actually recognize this, and it just goes to show that if you ever did flash your account, the way I do accounting actually links with some really fairly heavy ideas as well. The way we think in accounting of organizations is like that. <coughs> it's a um, semi-permanent membrane in a substantive environment. We tend not to worry beyond the substantive environment. And we think of organizations as things which deal with three types of things. It deals with goods and services, stuff, deals with information, deals with cash. And that's how we look at it. We see the transformations of these things back into other things which the organization works in. And accounting controls that process through recording it and guiding the way in which we use these things. Because you cannot conceive of a um, a successful uh, commercial organization these days, in the West anyway, without accounting being the means by which you articulate it. Um, growth, size, success, um, takeovers, mergers, impacts, they're all tend to be financial, we tend to measure what they are. And the way you measure things determines how people do, because it leads to the steering process. So your feedback determines where you go. There's a little world of accounting, and it's nicely sealed off, that big fat black line that's all around it. It's alleged to be permeable, but it really is. Now, let's just introduce uh, society, which kind of really screws accountants up. It screws capitalism up too, actually. But never mind, we'll keep on going. Because the point being is that uh, this process actually has impact on, on the society, much as we try and ignore it. The most obvious ones are the, uh, the things that we like. So the organisation we're certainly thinking of is more than just a simple, the first box, it's actually a more extensive thing. And it takes in, can't exist without infrastructure, which of course can just basically ignore. And it produces a whole bunch of positive things, which we hear enormous amounts about. Skill sets, social capital, intellectual capital, whatever capital we're interested in. But the fundamental one it produces is material well-being. Now, so far so good. That's the kind of thing that businessmen like. I used to love this talk. You got all the businessmen are like, yeah, 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 yeah. We produce man-made capital. That's what business does. It's the way in which accountants drive the world um, by this wonderful mechanism called organisations produces that little box of material well-being, which is the justification for the whole thing. Contributions to other things in society, a bit more dodgy. Uh, obviously it produces incomes and skills, but produces massive constraints, as we well know. The corporate sector is a massively repressive process, um, allowing certain things to be said and certain things not to be said. Produces social structures, which leads to values, where, you know, where everybody now believes you're worth it, when clearly it's going to be total bollocks and you're not. And, it's, um, and the development of infrastructure, both positively and negatively, the structure within which that material well-being is generated. For SD students, the next bit is the obvious bit. There is an environment out there, a physical environment, called an ecosphere by mistake, but never mind, I quite like, sort of quite like ecology sphere rather than economic sphere, which is the notion that the goods and services that the organization works with actually must come from only one or two places. They can only come from natural resources, <coughs> but it, or from previous production, which itself comes from previous resources. The organisation sucks in a whole bunch of non-priced assets which we tend to ignore, which we know about, or want to see biodiversity and so on. Indeed, ecological ethics are in there as well, we're all getting into that. And it produces waste. Now, why is this important? It's important because the top bit, which is what we're measuring, always talks about more and less, never talks about enough. Andre Gortz's quote. Characters know everything about more and all and 
less and nothing would better enough. And what we're always doing now, uh, especially in listed companies, and we'll come back to that, is encouraging more. More consumption, more growth, more production, more profit. That's the drive. That's what makes the whole thing go. Is you have to have more profit than last year, otherwise you are stagnating the language takes over. The more you grow that top little box, something quite interesting happens. You actually see that accounting is, is, is turning organisations into profoundly efficient mechanisms to take as much out of the biosphere as quickly as possible and turn it into waste as quickly as possible. That an organisation which may be seen as a wealth generating machine is, without question, a waste generating machine. And accounting is a mechanism that does that and will always be so once it's driven by more. So, the way in which the accounting drives, dominates, and is used must, by definition, be a waste producing machine. It's very difficult to make it otherwise. Now, there are limits on this. This is really talking about big organizations, and I can come back to that if you want me to. But it is interesting to actually turn the absurdity of what we take as being a good thing, turn it on its head and see the absurdity of it as a potentially dangerous thing. It inevitably is the case, therefore, that uh, if you do accounting the way we do accounting, which it drives organisations the way we drive organisations, then we're going to, what was Paul Hawkins' figure? 95% of all resources are back into landfill within three weeks, I think. So yeah, it was 92 or 96. I guess. It's some, yeah. some ludicrously large number, which you really should argue about. <coughs> it's more than 10%. You know, it's bad. Um, and that's, uh, that's because of us, because we're really, really good at encouraging you to increase the throughput of that little organisation up at the top, which ignores all this lot, and in doing so, produces the waste. That's what it is. Immensely efficient waste producers. And that is an essential problem of the accounting. Um, after I gave this talk, you're trying to, make, trying to make things boring and, and interesting. I actually had somebody come up to me once I gave this in Australia. He came up and he stood there and he said, I don't know whether to hit you or kiss you. I've been an accountant for 25 years. I resigned three years ago and couldn't stand it anymore. I became a nature conservationist. This is the first time accounting has ever been interesting to me. <laughs> Which is really <laughs> depressing. <you know? laughs> Never mind. Um, if one sees that that little, for those of you who don't know, that little box at the top is how I teach bookkeeping to the fish. I've just been doing it today. And you just need to expend, stay in that little box, and you will see accounting as a waste generating machine. So accounting destroys the world. Okay, that's, that's accounting. Now, the context within which accounting works is this thing called finance and capital markets. A lot of what one has to say is probably only limited to financial markets. But I think it's incredibly important, more important than accounting in the world are financial markets. Please, this is where people buy and sell shares, which seem innocuous enough and rather fun and a bit of gambling. What your mum and dad do in the Daily Express columns, you know, but ooh, look, spot a, spot a nice um, share and buy that, make a bob or two. And they are the driving force that produce the remoteness I'll come back to in a moment. How does it work? And, and the way it works is really very important. It's not called capitalism just for a laugh. Capitalism is in cap driven by capital. Now, capital and Adam Smith capitalism is, is a sort of control capitalism. Once it becomes liberal financial international financial capitalism, it's not driven by anything except lots of individual greed decisions. And capitalism is no longer controlled. Financial markets have profound power, total power. So much so that if you put it the other way around, um, I used to do, this stopped asking me, I used to do a lot of consultancy sessions with big companies on social responsibility. And what I would always do with them was choose, in my case, was Gandhi, and put Gandhi in the boardroom. And we'd work through how long Gandhi would last before you threw him out. And the most I've ever had is three weeks. Because he, he wouldn't be able to, because the financial markets would sack everybody else in the boardroom within a week or two because of the kind of decisions that you would make. What you've got is this phenomenal remoteness. You buy a share because you quite like to, and you buy it through an intermediary who themselves is buying and selling shares to make some money. These add up across the whole world to a bunch of signals. 
that the company has to respond to. The board of directors has almost no room for manoeuvre. If the share price goes up, they're good. If the share price goes down, they're in trouble. And people like to move in the segment. So their, their room for manoeuvre, their zone of discretion, is actually immensely tiny. Because they sit in their boardroom doing things, and out there are these millions of people buying and selling shares on apparently isolated accounting information, which is actually driving the company. And the company has to steer by reference to the accounting numbers which are related to these buying and selling shares. And when you buy and sell a share, you think, hey, I've made some money, I've lost some money. What you've actually done is you control the company because you're the only people with any power in capitalism. And that's the So you end up with a situation where nobody has control. Nobody actually, nobody actually has control. Directors can't do anything. I always remember a lovely moment. I was hauled across, I was wearing a tight time. In an interview I'd done very early on in the Green Movement, this is about 10, 15 years ago, by a, a financial director for whom I have still in regard. And he said, I agree with everything you say. What? And he called me across. He said, what, what do I tell my shareholders? I said, well, the greedy bastard. So we'll just stop worrying about it. And he said, well, he can't do that because he'll be out of a job. So I can say to him, you could be moral or make a stand, but you'll be out of a job in two weeks' time. Who, who would do that? The, the directors don't have a limited amount of power. The financial analysts do, hey, oh no. <laughs> could, you, uh, could you draw an analogy between um, these limited zones of discretion for, say, financial managers and something similar for politicians or policy makers? Or, um, you, could, you could, but I think, I don't think it's quite as brutal, to be frank. Um, yes, you're right. The politicians now are... They, they rule by newspapers, don't they? Yeah. So the way the next newspaper story. So if that is that that's a parallel that we're talking about, yes, there's own for discretion in that regard. But I suspect that power, papers are reasonably power in terms, powerful in terms of opinion. Whether they're actually powerful in terms of direct impact, that waits five years for the next election. Whereas directors can be sacked with three months time. Yeah. Um, now, the, the other point is, and maybe one should do something for the poor directors, is that um, they're on share options, and if the price of the shares goes down, their, their income goes down. And that's coming in from the states. We incentivize directors to actually act to maximize the share price. Now, in a world of pure liberalism, a freedom of world, that's actually good activity, in the same way as the papers argue, it's really good to keep the, share, uh, the politicians accountable. Because at least to complete short termism, and inevitably the bad drives out the good, and that's that's the killer here. It isn't that these are bad people or good people? It's just that there is no room for manoeuvre. I don't care who you are. You put Gandhi in the boardroom of Exxon Mobil. Exxon Mobil will either go completely to the wall, or Gandhi will be out of a job in about three weeks' time. They just can't afford to keep him in. So I don't care who you are. The zone of discretion is very slight. The capital markets. Working with accounting are immensely scary. Now, some people have spotted this. There's been some attempts, um, particularly by, this where be say Elzebub come in. If Elzebub has a manifestation on this planet, I think it's the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, I can give you an enormous amount of chapter and verse on this subject, including one Stephen Schmidt Heimlich, a very rich, very clever man, made his money for raping and pillaging, and now he's coming back into the world. Um, like George Soros, no? For example, I mean, perhaps not quite as cuddly as Joe Soros. <laughs> Joe Soros is just sacked a friend of mine, so. <laughs> and I still think he's relatively cuddly compared to Stephen Schmidt. Um, so, um, where were we going? Yes. He recognised that the link between structural issues of sustainable development and financial markets was dominant. He was probably the first public figure to do that. Not the first academic, the first public figure to see that if we are going to have a sustainable world with any kind of trade in it, we, financial markets are key to the process. I mean, Stephen schmidt Heine's team are phenomenally clever people who do great research, which he then turns into um, more palatable stuff for his members. Um, but he recognised the connection. And as a result of that connection, it has become more and more important to touch on the stuff that Crawford touched on which is that, that more and more research is commissioned 
to show that in fact being rich and sustainable are the same thing. The WBCSD produced a document three years ago, which they, they funded, very expensive piece of research, and the title is Sustainability Pays. That's the title. How would you know? Just insane kind of statements. And there has been a profound amount of research, some of it funded, some of it we don't know, which has argued that it is therefore being rich is responsible. And the argument very crudely goes like this. We have shown that generally speaking, more socially responsible companies have higher financial returns and better share prices. The shareholders therefore vote with their, their dollars and buy into more responsible companies because there will be less risks attached. This therefore means that more responsible companies uh, the, the richer companies are encouraged to be more responsible, which means, of course, because markets are perfect, that all rich people are responsible, which means all the bad things are done by poor people. Which is, it, did you notice the slip there? Um, but don't take my word for it. Uh, I can show you enormous amounts of research and, in fact, public business funded research. I'm trying to argue just that point, that the rich and responsible are the same. Uh, I gave this paper in the city last year said, actually, you're wrong, it doesn't. Never mind. People ignored it. So finance, I would think, is even more important. And why it's of interest to me, I know I'm an accountant, therefore I have an obsession with accounting. What is interesting <coughs> is how little research there is within the financial community of these issues. Very, very little indeed. There's a bit of the social responsible ethical investments like the university, but there's not a lot actually looking at the nature of finance. My obsession, as those of you on the spot and you talk about me, know, is accountability. Um, you can't be democratic without accountability. It's the key to any democracy. Now, the question is, what is the role of accountability? Well, companies are financially accountable, big, big companies. And they're accountable to whom? They're accountable to the rich people, to the shareholders. So the rich people have, are the only people with a privilege specially trained group of people being accountable to them as accountants. Accountants are trained at public expense um, under a monopoly of the Companies Act to actually provide information to rich people to make sure that companies are accountable to them. And even then you get anyone and things. It doesn't work. So accounting in many ways tends to be anti-democratic. You don't your demos cannot act, civil society cannot perform as a democracy, as an informed democracy, unless it's informed. And it cannot be informed unless it knows about those things which affect it, i.e. accountability. The media is supposed to do some of this, and I'll come back to them in a moment. But generally speaking, organisations, big organisations, particularly companies, are not accountable to civil society. Should they be? Parkinson, the lawyer, died recently. He argued that a democracy can only function if you regulate things. Or, uh, sorry, you... All organisations need some form of regulation. If we assume that people are not naturally good, then those tendencies which are in there have to be regulated. But you only need to regulate one or two things. You either regulate the thing, the activity you're interested in, environmental impact, say, or social justice, or you regulate disclosure about the thing, which is my obsession. I believe that if you change the way in which we dispose information about X, civil society could then behave in a different way and have more information. It would realise, for example, how important the mental markets are. So, the notion there is that we can expose conflicts. Uh, Amelka will know, because I've banged on endlessly about it, is that we cannot, in my judgement, even approach notions like social responsibility and sustainable development with a corporate sector like we have it without addressing conflicts. This is not a win-win-win situation. We are not going to consume more, get richer, and be sustainable. There's no evidence for that. There is no evidence. I've been looking for 30 years. I can find no evidence. If there is any, it's hidden under some small streets. And companies should tell us about it. But the claims that are made, you just breathtaking. I've got a book, I just picked it up the other day, and on the back of it it says, sustainability has long demonstrated that um, sustainability, that all stakeholders will benefit. There will be increased cash flows, increased profit, and increased environmental um, justice. What? It just... Oh, I misquoted it. The, the gesture is... What? And this is the, the issue you hear all the time. More and more claims of how I came to meet it. If that's true, 
must be fantastic. That really would be nice. Who wouldn't want it? Especially where the rich people we we, we love it. Yeah, the other ninety eight percent might like it less, but yeah, hey, we we like it. But it's probably not true. And if it is true, I've certainly not seen any evidence. So it seems that the key is that we must increase accountability, and that means giving markets and indeed the demos information. So my argument, the conclusion there is that we need to cut through the crap. There's just too much nonsense being talked about the interaction between the economic, the social, and the environmental, and we do not fully understand it. And we're never going to until we have more information. Most of this becomes unresearchable. Yeah. It just, it's only very recently. For most of my career, I couldn't get inside a company because my reputation perceived me. They would not talk to me about environmental issues. They would not. From 1990 to 1995, I was flavor of the month. Everybody wanted to talk about environmental issues. Too. But nobody, but nobody wanted to talk about social issues. Scandinavia, Northern Europe, slightly different. Britain, Britain, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Nobody would talk about social issues until about 95, 96, and social responsibility became sexy. So we've actually, you know, we've got a small amount of time in which data, there's a lot of suppression. Now, how do we get out of it? Well, there's a lot of ways. One is to persuade increased accountability. But what we see, and I think we don't use enough, is I just call them shadow accounts here, counter accounting. Are, the argument is if you don't tell us, we'll find out anyway. And if you don't tell us the truth, we'll make it up. So, um, Copper Watch, you've probably seen, you probably know that good consumer. Christian Aid caused an enormous stitching with their uh, analyses of Shell and their studies and so on. Um, the world is full, I'm glad to say, of these shadow accounts, which Milka and Chum has got involved in. You can put together, from a variety of sources, a really good account of companies. And we should do more of this, make them more public, and expose you know, Beelzebub's tribe of manifestations on this world. Um, so, more and more people are doing it. There's more through the web, the net, there's much, much more data available to us. And it's unbalanced and it's biased and it's aggressive and it's conflict laden, it's all sorts of stuff. <coughs> and it takes enormous amounts of time. But, but if they're making things up and sort of finding it out themselves because somebody went to, I mean, what, what do we know what to believe? I mean, that's right. just all. You right. don't. You don't know what to believe, and sometimes it's so com complicated. Um, I think that's a very serious question I want to address, very serious. Um, one of the issues I gave Malthus Group was to look at a company I've worked with for seven years. And um, the Greenpeace complaints over it was Dow Chemicals and um, the, uh, the agonies over Bob Powell that Greenpeace is putting Dow through. And I have been through I don't know how many meetings, I don't know how many books I've read. I think I know more about Bob Powell than almost anybody outside India. Uh, I exaggerate a little. I have no idea what went on. No. Um, um, I might need to explain exactly what happened in India. With oh, sorry. Oh, right. Bob Powell, the biggest chemical disaster there has ever been. Um, a chemical factory owned by Union Carbide blew up, mm -hmm. uh, released uh, a highly toxic chemical which is still killing people uh, 25 years later, it's the 1980s, this happened. How many and people are dying now? Pardon? How many people are dying Oh, now? I don't know. It, okay, I people. don't know. Hundreds, 100,000 or more, I have to say, of that order. You know, big numbers. The, the population of Dundee, some might say, that's the problem. Um, the, uh, but it, 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 the injuries run probably into the millions. Um, 25 years later, we're still arguing about it. Greenpeace is still arguing about it. At Greenpeace, um, Union Carbide went out of business almost mainly because of the expense of Bob Park, not entirely. But the, the stooshi we got into, these lawsuits, the, the chief executive was uh, made a criminal for everything the year. But so much other details happened. Dow there bought Union Carbide, big mistake. And Greenpeace went out to Dow because Dow's got money. And that's still going on. That's just one example of 25 years. I, I've got a real inside track. I've got two inside tracks, in fact, and I don't know what's happening. Now, I use that just as an example that we want, that sometimes what we don't know. I think it's too complicated, or it's just too obscure. 
but there's a preponderance of justice that we can sometimes talk about. And that's really what this is all about, I think. If, I mean, Christian Aid, a responsible organisation, they're going to get their facts wrong. I was very involved in an organisation called Social Audit Committee, who started some of these things 30 years ago. These social audits, these independent assessments of corporate and government behaviours. And they often got their facts wrong. But the point was, how could they get their facts right? Because they can't get access to information. Mm -hmm. So you make, you're doing your best with integrity to put it together as best you can. And it is very, very difficult to actually make an assessment. But what you're starting to produce is this notion, <coughs> which I think is very valuable, and I think this is the key to it, that a lot of companies will try and persuade you they are lily white. Their imaging, their marketing is just enormous. That is not the case. How could it be? They are, they are black and white. Where are their bodies buried? Because there will be bodies. And in that sense, what we're trying to do is produce a counter account. This is their account. You're worth it. You know, but it's our account. No, you're not. And if enough of it's done, what you then do is you start to suck data out of the company. It's in their interest, right? To tell a true story, because companies have some great stories to tell. They really do. But they've a lot of bodies buried as well. And my assumption is that in the present climate, partly as a result of violence and accounting, the people who get to the top of businesses cannot be people who can ever admit to mistakes because it's the nature of, of the beast, which is uh, a worry. So I don't think we'll ever know the truth, but what we will know is it's not simple and that you know, every statement should come with a health one, including my own. It's, um, it's a complex world out there and because it's big, it's going to get more complex. I like, I'm a small and beautiful man really, if it comes to everything. And the production of shadow accounts is an attempt to do that. Well, there's some on our website, it's more and more slowly being produced. BP, some friend of ours just produced one of BP. Very simple, counter account. BP are always telling you about what they're up to. No, they're not, they're up to this as well. So it's about balance. It goes all the way back to Charles Medawan. And the fuck they saw back in the early 70s. So that's a whistle stop tour, and indeed I kept it short as I because I thought there would be so many people here asking so many questions that we wouldn't have time to get through a lot of detail, so I'll cut it through the other end. Um, and there we have it accounting, finance, financial markets, accountability, and shadow accounts in 40 minutes. I'm going to stop on. Right. One more time. Thank you very much. Uh, questions. I know I have plenty, but I always open the questions at these <laughs> things. I don't know why, so someone else can open a question this time round. So anyone who wants to. Uh, <laughs> After you, sir. Hello. Um, I had a question about. Um, I had a question about um, about Enron and about. What exactly happened to um, to some of their CEO, CEOs, and about how how like how far have they been protected by the law, and how far can can we find people like their CEOs responsible for for what happens? I'm not an expert on Enron. I'd have to check my notes to give you a, a full and detailed answer. Um, and I don't even know anything about the prison yet. I think some of them have some of the smaller ones. Generally speaking, I'd be of the view that if you are a rich as heck um, CEO of a very large organisation behind you, you can keep enough lawyers busy to stop anybody getting at you. The law will work for you. It works for us money. Which is a great shame of what the US system it lacks that transparency. <coughs> but as you're coming back to it, one of the things you have to work at, it was only towards the end that they actually broke the law. What they did a lot of the time was, to, in terms of common sense, was utterly stupid. Was massively self-believing, massively hubristic, and almost certainly going to end up in a mess. But it wasn't illegal. It only became illegal right towards the end, when 
as a result, people can argue about insider trading, but particularly they started to break a few accounting laws. In fact, it was almost impossible, eventually they did. So that's kind of the strength of the American system, we also need this. Such a big organisation. I think, my, my, my instinct is that it's an instinctive uh, problem. Of all the audit firms that got caught in that process, I thought it was a shame that it was Apple Anderson, who I have more respect for than any of the others, for their death. Either my judgment is rubbish, or they were just unlucky. Um, but it's obviously systematic. I mean, I trained as an auditor, and the pressure on you to conform is profound. You, know, you start upsetting the clients, and you're off the job. I mean, in the story, you just don't do it. The system is, is geared. Because the public is so big and so apparently respectable, the system is geared towards protecting those who are protected. And most of the time, it kind of works. The corruption is systemic rather than local. Um, but that, that seems to me to suggest a sick system. Um, I nearly lost my job as a training auditor three separate times for questions that I still think were perfectly, they were naive, I realise that now. But they were perfectly reasonable questions, like asking the chief executive, isn't that stealing? She was pretty Yes, he was stealing. But um, <laughs> you, you can blame me for my naivety, but I'm an auditor. It's part of my job. Aren't I supposed to do that? That's what you said. I'm supposed to protect the public interest. That's how naive I am. Um, but I would do those kind of things. Um, this is why I'm there as an academic. Um, but, Surely our systems should be that open-minded and that innocent. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're not means, to my mind, there's something wrong with the system. Because the people in them are not evil people most of the time. I don't know many people who follow us in the, in the retail. So, sorry, that's a long with the question. I think everyone was systematic. What surprised me most was that people were surprised by it. A bit like 9-11. I was astonished that anybody was surprised by 9-11. Just... The only surprise was it happened that day, as opposed to any other day before or after. It was going to happen. Um, and Enron was going to happen. It just happened to be Enron. And it happened to be one of the biggest companies in the world. Not one of the leading so Because it's happening all the time. This is systemic rather than um, individual. Was that sort of an answer? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, just another question. Well, I suppose following on from um, what was asked before about, about how you can tell tell the, the, well, the, the black from the white or the truth from the lies, how can you tell, especially since, since greenwash has come, so, um, come to pass as, as such a major facet of a lot of companies reporting and, and, and branding and image, um, if, if there's the shadow counting which is doing part of a job, and it, how, how can we make sure that it's not going to be completely overridden by the powerful corporations who have money and resources at their disposal to just present the one the one side of the coin. Um, I think there's two answers to that, and I, the simple answer I don't know. If I knew, I'd do more of it. Whatever it is, I think one has to eventually get a government round to the idea of regulation again. Yeah. Um, as a very simple personal statement, I came into academic life with one ambition, and that was to change the Companies Act of the UK. Not a big ambition. I failed massively. Um, I got thrown out of the last company law review because I, well, my, my views preceded me. It doesn't mean I can So that was it. I've blown that. Um, you may have heard of the Operating Financial Review. But those of you, Michael Mead, just talked, you mentioned that. Um, I was involved in that process too. No. Um, they keep you out. So I would have liked to see the company's act to change, and the atmosphere still is not there. So I, mean, I think regulation has to change. We're going to see some of it change on carbon and climate change at last. It's going to be 30 years late, but we're going to see it. Um, and I think accountability has to change. I don't know how we're going to do it, but it has to. The other thing is that civil society has to become more informed. We have to, I don't know how we do this. My current obsession is, the, is absurdity. I'm more and more interested in how we can express things that we take for granted as absurd um, and, and, and ridicule. Ad, Adbusters are brilliant. Have you ever seen Adbusters? No. Get on the website and do a Google Adbusters. An American outfit who produce counter adverts. 
The only reason I only show them in my classes is because I can't get real time on the computers in, in, in the game. Um, they play in real time. And it's short little things. Um, there's a lovely one of Hendrix is playing the Stars and Stripes over, uh, over, over the flag flying in the breeze, and each of the stars go out, and a company comes on instead. Some of them are American, some of them are not. It's just little things like that. Um, and what is, it's called, it's called the product is you. You are branded. So there's lots of these things, counter and absurd ideas. But I think counter, um, counter accounts and shadow accounts is part of the process because it opens our eyes. I am astonished, and, and we, we have to try and connect up for ourselves. So I, I lose a lot of friends by being very rude about Tesco's. Um, there's some companies won't go to, and luckily lots of people go to Tesco. Well, stop it. Stop going to Tesco. Find something else to go to. I don't care who it is. I really don't care who it is. Just don't go to Tesco. Um, and, and there's some companies who, who get into the psyche. We have to persuade people that getting into the psyche is actually a natural thing to do. Uh, the, the, the you're worth it thing sends me apoplectic. I could become a terrorist for that advert alone. Um, I think people should die. Stupid statement. And so taking the piss out of your worth is, 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 is a good thing to do. Um, I don't know. So what I'm hoping is you guys think of something really great which changes the world for me. It'd be great. I'm really mad energy. Sorry, so that was long winded answer too. Yeah, do you know. think the picture you had in the beginning, the chart, um, with um, how with the Kind of accountancy and yes. how it follows through. Do you think um, you can make a more organic approach by um, kind of forming feedback loops back around? So it's not just this positive feedback in this kind of linear way of uh, to make you know we need positive, 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 and it doesn't matter what we're spewing out out the side, but sort of incorporate how because waste can be used for good as well. Oh, yes. If it's not just waste, and then feed it back. And make sure there is some kind of mechanism that has to then balance it out. So you're not allowed to just dump dump out. You need to somehow have it balanced rather than this plus and minus. They always have to keep balanced. Or do you think you have to rewrite the whole system? Okay. Um, I don't know the simple answer to that. Um, uh, the three or four, there's three or four elements within your question. One of them is this accountability thing we've just been talking about. If we improve the quality of information the civil society and markets have. Would it encourage the sorts of things you're talking about? And then we'd be in a position to quest, answer your question. One of the things I'm writing in the paper at the moment is that we know very little about the phrase Jeremy's full cost accounting. Different ways of really doing accounting systems. Now, it's easier to hold companies to account than it is to get them to change their accounting system, I have to say. But if we insist on a different accounting system, like carbon accounting, for example, or energy accounting, you're not allowed to count your money, you must account in energy, or you must account in carbon. That would transform companies as well. What we don't know is what the transformation would actually be because nobody will let you play with them. I mean, Jan and I used to give very early on years went around some companies with an idea we had, and we were shown the door. They all went, yes, that's a really good idea, I like that. Oh, I don't like that answer. Not like this. Come back in five years, ten years, fifteen years' time. Um, so we have we cannot experiment. Companies will not allow us to, because we don't know what that would do. But at the back of it is a theoretical problem. And it's around when it depart from the young man over here. Never mind. Modern neoclassical economics has a way of colonizing all of the values. And accounting is the way through which that is done. And there is a danger. But you don't cure the problem by adding more of the thing that causes the problem. And the posh name is juridification. Um, so there is a danger that by improving the accounting, you're actually making more of the thing that causes the problem. And the accounting itself is controlled by the people who are as interested in to keep the system going pretty much the way it is. So whether you died in there, we were having this conversation earlier today, whether you died in there and try and break it open, which I used to believe was possible or whether you hold to account, or whether you do everything you can think of. I have no idea. What you suggest is theoretically possible. We're clever creatures. We're stupid creatures as well. 
we're clever creatures. We can think of some way of doing this. Yes. We've come up with some quite good ways of doing this. But we don't know what they look like until we apply. So, yes and no. I suppose it's a short answer. Is that alright? Is that an answer? Uh, I asked myself for a yeah. Um, it's interesting you just mentioned the whole neoclassical thing just there. Yes. As you know, I take the view quite strongly that we currently, the current paradigm that's currently sitting in force is the neoclassical one where you have this rational um, representative agent and all of the system is built around the assumption that people more or less behave in this particular way according to the neoclassical mm -hmm. ideal of what a person should be. And the great thing is it's not even that person is, no one's ever claimed it was, it's rather this, you know, an ideal man is this rational utility maximizing, wealth maximizing, so on and so forth, maximizing maximizing utility to the widest number of people. But part of the neoclassical model is it treats everyone as clones, everyone has to be the same because the representative agent problems. And this assumption that, that we look at the world this way seems to pervade, as you just said quite correctly, into almost every facet of life. So surely, seeing as economics tends to replace its standard model of what a human should be every few hundred years or so, surely um, the thing to do is to replace this model with the new model with better explanatory power. And if it all goes to plan according to the way that physics, which economics holds so highly, says it should, then uh, in theory, a model with higher explanatory power should overtake the current system and replace it with a new and improved one. Maybe. That's where I part from you. <laughs> That's where you have to be part. I don't want to look to physics. The very notion of looking to natural science for a solution to social problems strikes me as fundamentally wrong. Not saying Entertaining, that, but wrong. I'm not saying that you do, it's rather that that's what they will expect you to do in order to be persuaded. My that's a way of reaching them. Mine's to do that. Okay. Um, two issues to, to, to give a short answer. The first is if economists claim to be rational and they claim to work through the, the Kuhnian paradigm, that their science is rational and therefore is, uh, sorry, pop. That through Popper, only refutable hypotheses are worth testing. Well, neoclassical economics is not refutable and therefore falls down. Therefore, all economists should, by their own rights, abandon all neoclassical economics immediately. So, you're dealing with that level of rationality. So, I don't think appeals to better nature is ever going to work. I mean, it's quite obvious that the assumptions of both neoclassical economics and I might say the fundamentals of financial markets. My colleagues who teach finance, and those of you who work do them, they have, they make economists look like warm, rounded people. Um, that there is, I mean, not as individuals, but in what they teach. And there is no question at all that when you teach these kinds of things, it affects people's morality. There's lots of research to show that the more you learn about this, the less moral you become. It's, it's normal. Um, Economics, the power of economics, as we know it, I think is actually centered on that selfishness, on that small assumption of selfishness, and, and that there is no other model um, that will replace it as such. It has to be a new notion of what it is to be human. The very fact that neoclassical economics colonizes is based on that notion of selfishness within markets. So that um, you know, every one of you know, that a moral behavior is going to cost you money. The more you let the, your personal values determine the job you take, the less you're going to earn. The next time you don't pay on the train but wish to because of moral, it's going to cost you. Moral decisions usually cost you money. Now, in a world where money is just one of the things that matter, it doesn't matter, but we live in a world where money becomes the currency of all things. And therefore it becomes, you are stupid. Anybody who doesn't maximize their money is obviously stupid. They are indeed irrational, which is close to insane. So it's colonized our very notion. Words like value are difficult to work with outside finance, for example. So the colonization, I think, actually all stems from that notion of agency right at the heart of it, and that no other model could ever colonize the world to the same degree. Religion manages it periodically. But I, I suspect the agency model is near religion. And it won't, I don't want economics to have that view. You're not sure about that? Anyway. Well, I'm screwing my face up because look at the history of how neoclassical economics fell in the first place. They replaced models of pain for it and they. Yeah, religion. That's right. Work. Not necessarily religion, actually. Well, the way I used to teach it to it was more religious. Over sure. Yeah. Well, I had to get it over in about 10 minutes flat was uh, 
we started off with the purpose of man is the greater glory of God. And then we moved from there to a uh, greater good, greater number. And there we moved to utility maximizing, and from there we used to cash flow maximizing, which is what we teach in finance. So the pursuit of short term self maximizing is an approximation of the greater glory of God. And you know, five easy moves we've got from David Hume through via Bishop Barclay to Friedman. <laughs> and, and that's, that's my take on it. Um, because the way it's perfect information effectively requires that humans have godlike powers. It assumes that humans have perfect knowledge of all possible future states, which seems to me to be equal to God. So Absolutely. it puts man right up there at the very top, sitting right the right hand side or left hand side, I don't know which it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's to me. Do you think um, in popular science things like uh, Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene, and a lot of this that's coming through in um, uh, of we're taught in biology, for example, there is no such thing as um, group selection or whatever. Um, it is just selfishness, which is obviously not true. Um, do you think that affects how we regard ourselves in relation to other people and therefore kind of counteracts working together for greater good because everyone just wants to work for themselves? And feel that they're allowed to do that because, oh, we're yeah. genetically modified. Yeah. I, I know you're going genetically to... Genetically done... I don't feel common, uh, competent to answer that question. I mean, I can speculate, just like anybody could, but I haven't thought it through. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of those forces. But which is chicken and which is egg? I have no doubt that something like the selfish gene would not have got the mileage it has had we not already mm -hmm. had a fractured society and had that society not been fractured by, I guess, neoclassical economics. So, um, I'm not sure which way around it's going. I think they're all part of the same process. It's probably not linear, but I don't know. I'm just not competent to answer that. Not good to wildly speculate by any chance. <laughs> then oh, again, you also oh. have things like love luck, which is relatively common. However, uh, I did meet a PhD student in the evolutionary biology who did not know who James Lovelock was, and I was just like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, there'll be lots of people who wonder what and other people. We had the conversation, and one of our conclusions earlier today was that maybe the purpose of education <coughs> is to avoid anybody acquiring wisdom, mm. uh, <coughs> which is kind of scary, uh, but might be true mm. in any sense. Um, and why is this, why is this be stiff? That's a good idea, but it might be true. Um, so yeah. people say. Do we need another crisis? I mean, how many crises do you need? Do we need more information? No, we, 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 we've got shed loads of information. I'd like to know why 30 years ago it wasn't obvious. Why it taken? I, I don't know, I didn't tell you. I, I love this story. My mum, who's a lovely sense of humour, rung me up just before Christmas and giggled at me on the phone and said, Do you know, Rob, there's an environmental crisis? <laughs> and I giggled again. And she said, That nice, Mr. Gore says so. Giggled again and put the phone down. <laughs> She's been listening to me banging on for 30 years, and I'm not alone. We've all known this stuff. Okay, maybe they, there's more and more preponderance of evidence, but the likelihood was there 30 years ago when we could have done something about it. But you couldn't get the time of day for it. It wasn't just the ideas were not accepted, i.e., love luck is excluded. It is you were not allowed to address love luck seriously. You could not do it. And you could not. Schumacher. It's a great model for management. No way. You cannot do it. I was turned down for jobs. I wanted to teach social accounting. No. Didn't let me. No. If you want to teach social accounting, you're not coming here. It's not accounting. Best advice I ever got from a professor was as a wee laddie in church. No. no. Uh, right at the beginning of, of a career was, if you want a career, don't do this stuff. And he meant it for, he meant it from the heart. The suppression of knowledge and debate is terrifying me more and more. It looks like we're helping. It looks like we're helping these conversations. But it's very hard to do so. I mean, we all know that. So we all know it in various ways. I, I spend most of my time in the county schools where everything I have to say has been treated as total nonsense most of the time. In fact, it turns out to be right. Nobody's saying sorry now. Oops. <laughs> so the, the suppression of knowledge, I think, is more scary. I am. Um, I'd be delighted to let um, the selfish gene through, as long as we let Gaia through at the mm. same time. I, I, the suppression of worthy knowledge, 
Well, also, also it tends to be that we get narrower and narrower, so everybody is focusing on one thing each, because we get seem to get deeper Specialization. And, deeper, and it's so yes. specialised that it's not all necessarily linked. I mean, I, I yes. agree in both the selfish gene and guy theory. Right. But, you know, <coughs> not necessarily how it's expressed, because right. it kind of... You've hit a really difficult problem that we've all got, I think it's part of the wisdom thing. Um, my parochial take on it is, when I wrote the, the first book on environmental accounting in 1923, 15 years ago, um, I made most of it up. There was almost nothing happening. It was based on single ideas and developed. And sort of, it mostly turned out to be true, as it happened, thank goodness. It was a real gamble. When I rewrote the second edition in 2001, I couldn't get it all in. And now I wouldn't even try. I mean, that's the expansion of one teeny weeny itsy bitsy little area in just a very few years. And we've all got this problem. We're trying, we are ignorant and we must approach our life as ignorant. And most of our great brains are, you're right, counting angels on the head of a pin. I think it was ever thus. But it gives the impression of busyness and of, of knowledge increasing. And what it's doing is increasing noise. Mm -hmm. More and more stuff you've got to wade through, you've got to read more and more things. Um, it's a substitution of effort for work. A lot of people like to do a great deal of effort. It feels like a huge amount of work, but actually it's not. You're just mostly running around and big huge circles. Only and reading through things. I'd, I'd like to write words like efficiency and effectiveness. Yes, and then yes. I'd agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. more about the lack of communication between these things, because obviously but one individual human is not going to be able to know everything, but you know, we have developed something called language. and. Yeah. But even there, we get into have a mass or tell us problems there. No, again, I'll give you another parochial example, which I, I think illustrates that I'm as guilty as anybody. We're all guilty of this process. Which is, I think I've had three good ideas in my life, which is quite a lot. And I'm quite proud of those three. And I should therefore have written three things. I've written nearly 300. So that's about 290 redundant bits of noise in the system because I'm encouraged to do so, and people forget, and if it's written more than six months ago, they've forgotten it. I'm producing noise, and I'm sorry, and what am I doing? <laughs> that notion of producing noise all the time is, 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 part, is the other part of the problem. There's, you've got to wait through this nonsense to find the odd nuggets, so that's part of it. The more and more specialization, yes, that's the problem. Um, Failure to talk, very to free up talk. We need more and more. We talk about interdisciplinary, but it won't get through the RE. You know about the RE. Yeah, cross discipline. You don't know about the RE? Accreditation, I think. No. Oh. no. oh, I am so proud of you that you've got this far without knowing about the RE is why academics behave they do. The research assessment exercise. Oh, oh. oh right, yeah. Now we have the history. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. And it determines why we behave in these rather completely dysfunctional manner. We have to. Mm. to Protect our universities and our departments and our jobs. And your political position. And it increases your political position. Yes, it didn't used to, but it does. And that's going to change again. So, I mean, we're motivated by all the wrong things. And of course, it was put together by economists. So, there we go. Yeah. What you measure is what you get. I know my father is uh, coming when he's just in the process of rewriting it, actually, because he's now got to such power that he's able to modified according to what he thinks is the right thing for it to be, which needs to say Mark Sundan as being far better than everyone else in the entire faculty. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. Nice different slightly. I can think about retirement after the next one, so I have to hate whatever the system, I don't care. I can just do what I want to do. Um, what's the time, by the way? It's half eight. Right, one more question or so, and then we shall have to stop, I'm afraid. Anyone at all? Mel has asked all the questions and she knows all the answers anyway. Most of my answers are wrong. Well, I don't know, I think there's a certain wisdom in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think Mel thinks most of my answers are wrong. No. She told me, right at the beginning, she joined my course. I'm going to show Before you. Before I joined your course, I think I've proved it or something. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have confidence in your judgment. <laughs> well, brilliant. So have you become convinced or, or moved or changed anything with your position? Uh, I just got confused and then cleared up and I got confused again even more and just like it's a cycle. Yeah. 
you're in the complex. Your understanding and confusion are more complex than they were. Yes. Uh, as a teacher, I can ask you no more. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Right. Thanks, Leo. Thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much. Right. Um, yep, yeah, thank you all very much for coming, and uh, we'll see you all again. Cheers.